Hey, welcome back to Clean Cut, where we can talk about the truth about just about anything, as long as we use logic and common sense. This season, we'll be discussing the early councils of the Church and how doctrine developed in those early times. Officially, there have been 21 ecumenical councils in Church history, but I think the first 10 will be enough for this season. Today, we'll be discussing the 8th official ecumenical council, the 4th Council of Constantinople. This council began in 869 AD in an attempt to resolve the Photian Schism. To understand that, it's important to understand who Photius was and why there was a divide between the Eastern and Western churches in those days. Photius was a statesman and military commander of considerable education, whose brother was married to the aunt of the emperor and who experienced rapid career advancement because of it. Unfortunately, the emperors in those days were lacking, each in their own way, with one, Michael III, being called Michael the Drunkard, and his successor, Bardas, living in an incestuous relationship with his daughter-in-law, Eudocia. Because of this, and perhaps following the example of John the Baptist, the patriarch of Constantinople, St. Ignatius, refused to give him Holy Communion. Infuriated by this, the emperor ordered Ignatius deposed and banished, then hurried Photius through holy orders in six days, and had Gregory Asbestus, a man who Ignatius had excommunicated for insubordination, consecrate and ordain him patriarch of Constantinople in Ignatius's place. Now, if you've been paying attention throughout this season, you should already see a problem here. Only bishops can ordain bishops, and excommunicated people can't ordain anyone. Furthermore, because emperors lacked the authority to remove a person from the position of patriarch, there was already a patriarch of Constantinople when Photius was ordained, Ignatius. The emperor kept trying to legitimize his choice by convincing people that their Christian faith obligated them to obey their leaders, and by trying to get Ignatius to voluntarily give up his position, but Ignatius didn't give in, and the Pope recognized this as a severe overstep of government power over the Church. However, in the meantime, Photius continued to operate as though he were a patriarch, so ultimately this council was held to put the issue to rest for good. Photius was condemned, and his supporters anathematized. Unfortunately, the judgment of the council was not adopted by the Eastern churches, some of whom still revere Photius as a saint to this day, and tensions between the East and the West remained high for centuries after this. Still, it may have seemed at the time that there was hope of reconciliation between the churches, which may be part of the reason that the church held off on declaring this council a general or ecumenical council for so long. However, when relations didn't improve, but just grew worse, and the Great Schism finally formed between what we now call the Catholics and the Orthodox in 1054 AD, it may have been that someone judged clarity would be more valuable than diplomacy. We don't really know why this council was only classified as ecumenical at a later date, but that would seem to be the theory that best explains the facts. This council is now in the books as an ecumenical council of the Catholic Church, though the Eastern Orthodox, of course, don't recognize or honor it, nor do they think of any of the other ecumenical councils since then in the same way as the ones that took place before, because at those first seven, all the Christian leaders of the world were present, and it is true that that hasn't really happened since then. In addition to the condemnation against Photius and his supporters, this council also established a large number of canons, most of which either had to do with refuting the actions of Photius and his men, or reinforcing rules or canons established at previous councils. However, there were a few new things added as well. New converts to the faith were forbidden to become bishops. Bishops, patriarchs, etc. weren't to be treated as being at fault until judged to be so by a church synod or council, and the view that people have two souls was anathematized. Managers of houses and estates of leaders were forbidden to receive special honors in the church of Constantinople, and dignities and honors in the church were reserved for those who'd gone through the necessary steps in the clergy. Bishops were instructed to act in a way that demonstrated that their position was more honorable than the positions of secular leaders, not groveling before worldly leaders or trying to curry special favor with the powerful, but treating everyone with the right level of respect. Some lay people had started wearing priest-like or bishop-like outfits in mockery of the church, and they were ordered to stop doing that or risk being banned from the church. General councils were given priority over local ones, and even over the wishes of the local rulers of those areas, and removing the church's property by force was forbidden to world leaders. 
Bishops were forbidden to confiscate anything from anyone or to give away the property of other regions, world rulers were forbidden to expel church leaders, and bishops were forbidden to delegate important litanies and sacred mysteries to other bishops serving under them. Finally, procedures were established to allow clerics to appeal to a church synod for justice if they believed they were treated unfairly by a bishop. It would be quite some time before another big council like this would be held, and by that point the schism would have occurred between the Catholics and the Orthodox. This disunity within the Church still has not been fully mended. Next, the First Lateran Council. That's all for now, so keep asking questions, and thanks for watching.